up here first, our last panel of the day today is focused on what you've heard a lot about in all of the sessions today, uh, state and local implementation of international human rights standards. Um, Risa Kaufman will be moderating the panel, so I'm going to turn it over to her for introductions. Um, you all heard Risa's bio earlier, but for maybe those of you who weren't here and aren't familiar with Risa's work, uh, she is the executive director of the Human Rights Institute at Columbia Law School in New York and has traveled a long way to be here with us today. So thank you, Risa, and uh, thank you, panelists. Thanks, Lisa. So, um, everybody, I feel like everybody should stretch a little bit. I never know what's up, but just keep our energy up for the last panel of the day. Um, I'm really excited to be moderating a panel on implementation of human rights at the state and local level. It's something that we've alluded to and also spoken directly about throughout the day. So here we have an opportunity to hear some really exciting examples. Um, as you all have heard, human rights really do offer a strong framework for articulating local concerns and also holding local governments accountable. And states and cities in the United States have a very long history of um, engaging in efforts human rights activities, particularly efforts to influence human rights in foreign countries, right? So there's a long history of state laws requiring uh, disinvestment in rights abusing countries and regimes, for example, the Massachusetts Burma laws. Um, states, cities, and counties in the United States also have been turning uh, more recently to internally focused human rights activities um, in an attempt to influence domestic policy and practice. So some of them draw on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a set of guiding principles. Others adopt resolutions um, that are urging or endorsing uh, human rights treaties that the U.S. has yet to ratify, and others will fashion more wholesale approaches to incorporating human rights into local decision making, um, both ratified and unratified treaties. There are a lot of exciting examples that have emerged over the last few years. Um, to name just a few, we've seen a number of state and local ordinances and resolutions centered on human rights. For example, a human right to housing resolution in Madison, Wisconsin, um, a, right, a human right to be free from domestic violence in a number of cities, including Baltimore, Maryland, and Miami, Florida. Um, in 2010, the California State Legislature passed a resolution calling on the State Attorney General to prepare templates um, for cities and counties um, and state agencies to assess their own compliance on, uh, with human rights treaties that have been ratified by the United States. We heard the wonderful example from Colin this morning um, about California's human right to water legislation. So indeed, many of the most exciting and cutting edge examples of state and local implementation originate in California. Um, Berkeley's uh, Peace and Justice Commission has long been uh, implementing and integrating human rights at the local level. So I'm really happy to be talking about this with folks here in California. Um, this is not foreign to folks in, in California. Um, as you heard uh, this morning earlier, international law, of course, anticipates um, that state and local or subnational entities will, um, will implement human rights, um, but it, uh, it still holds the federal government ultimately responsible um, for a state's failure to implement treaty obligations. Um, state and local implementation is consistent with the U.S. Constitution and the Supremacy Clause. As you also heard this morning, it's also consistent with how the U.S. ratifies treaties and the federalism understanding um, that we have added to the treaties, which I have a positive read on, um, which is that it articulates a shared division of labor between the federal, state, and local governments. It um, empowers state and local governments to implement the treaties, um, but of course the federal government still is ultimately responsible and has to provide the resources um, and uh, supervision. Um, there are doctrinal limits on what the federal government can do to compel state um, and local authorities to comply with human rights treaties. They can't do much <laughs> to compel them. Um, but there's a lot that the federal government can do to encourage state and local governments to, um, to comply with their treaty obligations. So in this panel, we're going to talk about, we're going to get very concrete about examples of state and local governments um, embracing and integrating a range of human rights activities to influence domestic uh, policy and practice. I'm thrilled to be joined by these experts. So we have Zoe Polk, who's an attorney and policy coordinator with the San Francisco Human Rights Commission, where she oversees the commission's efforts to reduce discrimination based on prior convictions and coordinates the Equity Advisory Committee, among other initiatives. Um, David Kay uh, directs the International Justice Clinic at UC Irvine School of Law, where among other projects, he and his students are focusing on state execution of the ICCPR in the United States. 
And Ann Liebman is the policy director at the San Francisco Department on the Status of Women, where since 1995, she's been responsible for, implement, uh, for implementing CEDAW in San Francisco. Um, so we have great experts. I thought we wanted to make this panel a little more interactive um, rather than us talking at you. So I thought I would start by just asking our panelists to share with us some successes of local implementation. Um, and in particular, if you could talk about one or two examples um, from your work of how you have used human rights or um, worked uh, with the human rights framework um, at the local level. Zoe, do you want to start? Sure. And I just want to thank you um, for having us and uh, I thank the audience for attending. Um, so I work for the Human Rights Commission. And, um, and so we are the executive agency in the city that enforces the city's non-discrimination laws. So all your basic protected categories that you can see in federal law and state law, uh, like race, religion, uh, sexual orientation in state law. Um, and then in San Francisco, we, have our, we also have additional categories like HIV AIDS status, gender identity, um, source of income, and other protected categories. So we house those ordinances. And if someone has experienced discrimination in a business, uh, an employment, uh, public accommodation, or housing, we are the agency that would take those complaints and, and try to uh, rectify uh, the harm that was done. In addition, we also examine ways for the city to engage in broader human rights issues. Um, so one of the things, so my main job, is, as, um, as Lisa was, say, Lisa was saying, um, is looking at the criminal justice initiatives. So if we think of ways for the city um, and hopefully the country to engage in broader human rights discuss discussions, one of the big issues is uh, criminal records, right? How people with criminal records are treated, how it is legal to discriminate against them in a lot of senses, and, and housing and employment, and who is that impacting? When we think of people who have criminal records, and we know based on the statistics and evidence available, who are the people who have criminal records, and what are we essentially saying when we say, you are not entitled to apply for a job, you are not entitled to get public housing, you are not entitled to get um, financial, uh, financial aid for college, what, in, what is the impact of that on society as a whole? So, and what are the ways for the government to engage in that? What are the ways for San Francisco to engage in that issue and, and, and address that huge, um, the huge need in those communities? And what is the way for us to maybe be a trailblazer for other cities in the state, cities around the country, um, and states, and also the state and other, other jurisdictions to, to follow a model that could be sex successful, successfully used uh, in San Francisco? Um, so that's one example um, of one of the broader policy issues that, um, that I work on. Um, in terms of, of, of a success, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, the policy work that we've done on the use of condoms with evidence. Um, when we were thinking about this panel, we want to talk about what the value is on, of human rights on a local level. Um, and when I think about the value, I think about government services, right? We all pay our taxes and we, you know, we expect certain things from, from the government. And the ideal is that government provides good services and provides and meets the people's needs, right? But we certainly know that that does not always happen and there's times when the government maybe can do more harm than it does good. Um, and, and particularly when we think about the tension between safety and human rights, right? So one example um, that I want to talk about is the use of condoms as evidence in, in the city of San Francisco. Um, the police department uh, had a policy where uh, when they, when they, uh, when they uh, arrested someone who was suspected of prostitution, um, they would collect the condoms and take pictures of the condoms and use them as evidence in the criminal trial to establish that the, the woman was engaging in prostitution. Um, we can all think of the broader human rights issues and, and also conventions and international law that might, um, uh, that might you know, tell us that that might, why this is a bad, bad policy, right? So the Human Rights Commission um, could have taken a number of different steps, um, could have you know, called out this and say this is a bad policy and we think you should change it. Um, uh, we could have uh, you know, written something and said, uh, you know, we think you, this, is a, this is a better policy, we think you should change it. What our approach was to do is bring together uh, a lot of different stakeholders, uh, police department, <coughs> district attorney's office, community people, people for who uh, represent uh, sex workers, people who are part of a collective of sex workers. How can we create a policy that balances public safety People's, and people's human rights, right? People's rights to, to, you know, ha to have a, a, a street where they feel comfortable walking down um, or have a neighborhood where they feel like um, is safe for their children and people's human rights to protect their bodies no matter what their profession is, right? How do we balance those and what is the, what is the city policy and come out of that? So we brought together all these partners in a round table discussion. And one of our prime objectives was to get different sides, of pe different sides, of people on different sides of the issue to hear each other and listen to the different priorities of, of, of both sides.
decides why this poli why a policy needs to come like from a consensus. And because of this this listening that I don't think a lot of them were able to do to be in the same room together, we were able to create a policy that got at the, the police officers need to uh, to you know to ensure that people are not going to uh, to ensure that people are deterred from this crime from prosecution, um, but also does not punish people for doing things to protect their body. So um, so we created this new so so long story short the policy is more technical but long story short po police officers are not collecting um, we're not collecting condoms and using them against crime in, in, in the court. Um, and I'll leave that example there and take it away. <coughs> So thank you, Zoe, and thanks, Risa, for the introduction. Thanks, Lisa, for organizing this really interesting day, which has been very enlightening for me. So I'm not going to talk about a success story. I don't have a success story to tell. Um, <laughs> at least I don't have one that I'm going to share today. But um, what I'm going to talk about instead is uh, an initiative that we're really at the, um, at the very foundational level uh, in, in starting at UC Irvine Law School's International Justice Clinic, which is sort of a fancy name for the Human Rights Clinic that we just started. The clinic just started last year. As many of you may know, the law school at UC Irvine just graduated its second class. Um, so it's a very new law school in the UC system. So, um, so the, the, the project really started from uh, as, a, as a think piece, a kind of a, um, a where we were thinking about uh, we've got the ICCPR, and I want to thank Jamil for. Uh, really providing a great overview of the ICCPR earlier today, and so I'm, I'm going to put that all to the side, except to focus on a couple things. But we looked around and said, look at the ICCPR, look at all of the good that's being done in places like San Francisco and Wisconsin and other places uh, where you see human rights being implemented and being integrated into really local uh, governance. Um, but it's not happening at the state level. And we, we were asking, you know, why is that? Why, why is it that the ICCPR isn't really being implemented at the state level? And you go back to 1992, the U.S. ratification of the ICCPR, and it's the two things that Jamil pointed, at, pointed to. Um, so one is the federalism understanding, which was essentially the federal government kind of saying, you know, wiping its hands of it and saying, you know, we'll do what we can do within our jurisdiction, uh, and then the states will do with you know, what's within their jurisdiction. Of course, the federal government will assist, but it, it hasn't really. So there's the federal, federalism understanding. And the second one is the, the declaration related to non-self-execution, which fundamentally means, when saying that the ICCPR is not self-executing, it means that there's no cause of action that arises under the ICCPR. And in thinking about that, we thought, look, the federal government is not going to change that calculus. Congress, a Congress that rejects the Disabilities Convention, is not going to be the Congress that provides a cause of action to litigants in federal court. Uh, and, and I should add here that when the ICCPR has been interpreted in state and federal courts, um, or when it's been referred to or raised as a potential cause of action, courts across the board have said there is no cause of action because, because the treaty is not self-executing. So what we thought was, well, since the federal government isn't going to do it, why not the states? What would be preventing the states from implementing the ICCPR or any other human rights treaty that the United States has ratified or potentially even that it hasn't ratified? What's stopping the, United, the state of California, for example, from adopting the ICCPR in some form, and, and I'll talk about that initiative, although I, want to spend, I don't want to spend too much time on this because we could talk about it more in discussion, but what's stopping the state of California from incorporating the ICCPR and saying to litigants, uh, you, you have a cause of action uh, uh, under the covenant? Whether we're talking about the core articles 6 through 27, those core substantive provisions that have the particular rights, or if we're talking about something more general simply by reference to the ICCPR. And so what we've started to do uh, at, in our clinic at Irvine is um, to initiate a kind of a long-term project that first looks at what would incorporation of the ICCPR look like, and then taking it to the next step, asking questions about how we actually build a coalition to uh, encourage the state to adopt the ICCPR as a matter of state law. So that, that's in a nutshell what the initiative is. Um, and, um, and, and I just want to make a couple of points uh, about it. So 
The first point that I want to make about it is, um, is something that I already alluded to, which is that, uh, in my belief, uh, in my view, states can implement the ICCPR. Now, you know, there may be a response that says, well, this is a treaty, so it's a federal matter, so, so isn't it preempted by federal law? I actually think, picking off on what Risa said earlier, I think we should read that federalism understanding in the most positive, permissive way possible, which I think is actually the natural reading, which is the federal government left it to the states to decide how to implement the ICCPR. So as a federalism matter, it actually can be interpreted as being perfectly consistent with uh, with the ICCPR and with our ratification to, um, uh, to implement the ICCPR. So the first step is to see it as a per permissive strategy. The second is, um, is to ask, well, is this the only way forward? And this is sort of the realist part of it, which is, is the state of California, which, let's be honest, the state of California is, is particularly in its configuration legislatively right now, is as progressive as it's likely to be, um, and particularly if you're looking comparing to other states, this is the time to think about implementing human rights at the state level. Um, but is having a cause of action likely to be successful? Is it the only option? I don't think it's the only option. There are other mechanisms or other measures that we could imagine the state taking that would lead us to a place where there's encouragement for the ICCPR to be used to be referred to uh, in state court litigation. So obviously, from my perspective, the ideal situation is it's implemented and there's a cause of action, but there, there are others. There, there's next best kinds of, kind of um, options. One would be a sense of the legislature that makes a positive reference to the ICCPR in, or, in order, in a sense, open the door for judges to make more positive reference uh, to the covenant and to be more willing to accept arguments that involved that bring in human rights, and I'm saying the ICCPR could be any other human rights treaty as well, but be more accepting of arguments under international human rights law. You could also imagine administrative mechanisms that the state would adopt that would require some kind of human rights law assessment in a variety of, er in a variety of areas, and we could, we could talk about what those areas uh, might be. Um, there are, of course, I think there's some positives uh, about moving, moving in a direction toward, um, toward implementation of the ICCPR, and I just want to mention a couple of those, mention a couple of the negatives, and then, and then stop talking so that we could hear about what's actually happening on the ground here in San Francisco. On the positive side, um, I think one is, uh, I think there's a good case that can be made that, uh, that the United States is in breach by not implementing the ICCPR. And so one could make, simply make the argument that it's an obligation of the United States, we could say of its subdivisions under Article 50, to have concrete implementation of the ICCPR. So one of the positives is simply to say, to put the United States, at least the state of California, into a place of closer compliance with its treaty obligation, right? So that's one positive. The other positive related to that is, at the present, there is no legal way to test U.S. compliance under the ICCPR or any of the other human rights treaties. So what, what a cause of action would allow is that specific testing of U.S. or state compliance with the ICCPR. There are others, other positives, I think, that are a little bit more esoteric or um, um, a little bit less tangible. One is just the engagement that that would bring. I, I, I kind of call this the um, Statewide Human Rights Lawyers Enforcement Act um, in the sense that if human rights law were a, um, a normal, um, you know, formal element of state law, then it would require uh, litigants and their lawyers to actually engage with human rights law, and that means human rights jurisprudence, not just the specific language of the ICCPR, but interpretations under general comments in the Human Rights Committee, um, re um, related, similar, very similar language in the European Court or in the Inter-American Commission in Court. It would really engage lawyers and judges and legislators in the language of human rights law in a way that does not exist statewide, particularly in our courts today. Um, 
And then finally, I think there's an element of influence that this would have. And, and this is less of an issue of, um, and I'm going to wind up with this, um, this is less of an issue of um, sort of what it gives to litigants and more the kind of influence that you might want to make an argument about in, um, in an environment that isn't naturally friendly or naturally used to human rights law arguments. And that influence um, go is, is both legal and, um, and political, I think. The legal influence is, at, the, at this time, the U.S. judges, although as we've seen at the Supreme Court level, they've incorporated or made reference to international human rights law from time to time. If we look at, if we imagine uh, judges actually engaging with the language of human rights law and the provisions of the ICCPR, we can start to imagine actual influence of that law internationally. So it's not just some you know, foreign body of law you know, that's out there, but it's something that we actually engage in, that we influence. It would also mean that our law would be influenced by it in a, in a more direct way. And I think that's, that's a positive going both ways. But also I think politically, maybe diplomatically, to the extent that US judges are actually engaging with the language of the ICCPR, actually implementing it, it certainly gives us another lever if you want to make an argument at the State Department, right? To say, look, our, we are engaging with this law. This isn't something that we only engage in at the time of the UPR or the Human Rights Committee, but this is something that is a part of our law today. I think that's, that's a value. It's, it may be a talking point, but I think it may be something more that we could use moving forward. So I'm going to stop there. I already spoke too long in, in trying to be not very interactive. Um, <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there afterwards. Thanks. Anne? Um, Okay, first of all, um, does everyone know what yesterday was? 50th anniversary of what? Equal Pay Act? <laughs> um, so we haven't come very far in 50 years, have we? The Obama administration put this out yesterday. Um, it says that a typical 25-year-old woman working full-time earns $5,000 less than the typical 25-year-old male. I think there's a few 25-year-olds here in the audience. Um, and so over a lifetime, uh, <laughs> that's uh, $431,000. And that's just the typical, not you know everyone else. So I mean, we haven't come very far using the law, right? Um, however, um, here in San Francisco, nonetheless, we have a law. Um, as many of you heard already today, um, all day long, you know, the US has um, signed but not adopted CETA. Um, CETA is the, help me out here, Convention on All Forms of Elimination Against Women. Did I get it right? Discrimination, Discrimination Against Women. I've been using this word for 20 years. I still can't do it. Um, so people came back from Beijing um, in 1995, the UN Conference on Women, looked around, said, you know what, we really don't think this is getting out of the US Senate. That was when Jesse Helms was around. You know, what can we do differently to show that maybe it wouldn't be so horrible to have this as a, as a statute or a treaty? Um, and where did they look? Well, San Francisco's a pretty friendly place, right? Um, we had a board of supervisors that had about three or four women on it at the time, and it was run by Barbara Kaufman, who um, was the female president at the time on the board of supervisors, and they said, let's see what we can do here in San Francisco. So they came back, they did a tremendous amount of job organizing. Um, Wild for um, Human Rights, Women's Institute for Leadership Development. Anybody here re work with Wild at all? Um, they don't exist anymore, sadly. They were actually absorbed by um, uh, Institute over at Berkeley. Um, but I, I'm not sure that they're even much in existence. But they basically were the organizing group that came over here along with the ACLU and um, the Women's Foundation and said, let's see if we can organize this in San Francisco. Let's see if we can get it adopted. Um, and sure enough, they did. Um, and they, they, I actually did not join the effort until the statute was almost done. We have um, the CETA ordinance, which was modeled on the UN Treaty, but adapted to fit San Francisco, was adopted as an ordinance here in San Francisco. Um, and, and also, just before I forget, um, in your packet, you have those CDs, and you have our 10-year history of everything we've done in San Francisco. So I'm going to go over it real, real, real quickly for t what we did for the first 10 years and then what we did for the last five years. Um, but you have this information already. So um, this, I'm into show and tell. 
Um, this is the book. It's called Making Rights Real. This book documents, and it's a training book on how you can take um, CETA as a model and adopt it locally, implement it. I mean, it has all kinds of great information. Wild put this out. Um, it's kind of out of print, but it's still online. If you can't find it for some reason, um, you can email me and I can find it for you. Um, it's a great, it, it uses San Francisco as an example, and it tells you basically how you can get CETA adopted. Um, I'm going to talk for about another minute on what CETA the statute is, and then I'm really going to move on beyond that. Um, because really what we've been doing is policy work here for the last 15 years. And it was in 1998 that it was adopted. Um, so it does use the same definition, pretty much the same definition that we saw this morning. It uses the words, um, the basis of sex that has the effect or purpose of impairing or nullifying the recognition. So I think someone this morning said that they um, did not pay their bar dues like I do not pay my bar dues, so I'm not technically a lawyer. So I'm going to ask, there's three lawyers sitting here at this table. What is the difference between effect and purpose? Anybody? Not barred in California. <laughs> <laughs> How about somebody from the audience? Right, so that's pretty good stuff. Remember, you know, how hard it was to find intentional? You can never find intentional anymore, right? Um, so that makes it a pretty broad definition. Plus, what else is different about our, our civil rights laws here? What else do you see in this definition up there that's, that you'd never find in a civil rights law? Look at the bottom. I'll give you a hint. It's the last um, two lines. Economics, yes. Do we have any rights to an economic... Um, Anything in this country? Yeah. Social, how about social? Um, cultural? Okay, civil, we have a few civil rights. But it's really um, a much, much broader definition than anything um, we would ever use in terms of rights of action. Okay, that's the extent of my legal analysis there. Um, and I'm gonna go on to talk a little bit about, um, so the statute here also focuses primarily on um, economic development, violence against women and girls, health care. Here's the bad news. Um, our, uh, de our deputy city attorney, Amy Ackerman, who was working with us at the time, um, you know, was following orders. And guess what they put into this statute? Yeah, limits lawsuits, right. So there is no legal action you can take, um, which means that we do an awful lot of um, blame and shame. Um, I like to call it carrots and sticks. We don't really have a stick. Um, the only thing we have the power to do is subpoena people and subpoena documents, which we've never had to use. Um, but we do do a lot of blaming and shaming. Um, one thing different that the statute also did was it set up, Barbara Coffin was really insistent. This was not going to be another typical San Francisco thing where you come in, you make these great sounding programs. That's how much time I have left? Oh, OK already and I haven't even gotten started. Um, anyway, we set up a task force. The task force had, um, so it's a little different than the UN. You know how in the UN we already heard a lot about shadow reports um, and UN commissions and members. We in San Francisco decided we'll put them all together at one task force. So we had all the community folks together with all the bureaucrats. And let me tell you, it was tough going there for a while. Um, they don't actually talk the same language most of the time. Um, and I sort of came from a, a somewhat of a civil rights background, but I was working for government, and so it was a tightrope at times. Um, so quickly, you know, here's a few of the things that we did. Um, in 1999, the task force was created. In 2000, we developed a set of gender analysis guidelines. We actually got a hundred thousand dollars to hire a staff person. That was not me, but we hired a staff person. Um, to, to staff the task force, and we got an extra $50,000 to develop a set of guidelines. So we hired some human rights experts from New York. They came out. They had never dealt with San Francisco. They didn't know what they were getting into. It was a lot harder than they thought to develop these guidelines. They turned out to be 30 pages long, um, and uh, they were a little intense. Um, just a few other highlights. Um, we did a study in, on work-life policies and practices in 2001. It was started in 2002. You would not believe how difficult it was to do a study here. I mean, all we did was, me this was before pre-11, we mentioned the word telecommuting, and you would have thought that that was some kind of evil thing back then. 
Um, and the um, city attorney came after us, basically trying to stop us from doing this study because they, the city of San Francisco didn't want to talk about telecommuting. That would mean uh, city workers would be out of their view and out of their control, and who the heck knows what they'd be doing. Then 2011 happened and everything turned around. Now they advertise that you can work at home on the uh, human, so I guess that's an achievement. You know, that they went from fighting us tooth and nail to even looking at this study um, to bragging about it. Um, uh, we did a study on girls in San Francisco using um, desegregated data, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, before that, data had only been collected on women, boys, uh, youth. Youth, and when you collect a lot of data on youth, guess what it's about? Boys. So we never really looked at data separated from girls, uh, boys and girls separate before, and sure enough, we found out there's some pretty interesting trends, like why do girls get into the juvenile justice system? Guess what? It's not for the same reasons that boys get into the juvenile justice system. Um, Oh, in 2003, um, the Board of Supervisors adopted a resolution asking us to do a gender analysis of budget cuts. That was the last recession, and so we ended up doing a resolution on um, budget cuts. I'm gonna talk in a minute about what that ended up looking like. We amended the, the statute in 2003 to actually add CERD. Um, the task force actually dissolved itself in 2004, and it all came under the Commission on the Status of Women, which is like the Board of Directors for our department. Um, and so they now supervise um, any of the reports that come um, are held at public hearings at the Commission on the Status of Women. We did a gender budgeting training for the mayor's office in 2007. We launched the um, Gender Equality Principle Initiative. So for 10 years, um, from 98 to 2008, pretty much, we focused on city departments. We did seven different gender analysis, um, and I'm, I'm gonna talk about that in a minute unless I have to stop. Um, but then in 2008, we, s okay, I'll stop. Um, let me just quickly see. This is gender analysis real quickly. Um, strategic planning with a gender focus, highlights best practices, areas of improvement. Um, I wa just want to show what desegregated data is. So desegregated data is basically looking at data by sex and race and other social identities such as immigration status, language, sexual orientation. Most of the time when you look at data, it's like men are over here, women are over here, and race is somehow different. Um, and they don't put those two together. And, and they certainly don't put together things like immigration status, language, sexual orientation, disability, and age. So um, that's what desegregated data is all about, and that is really the basis of a lot of the work that we do is, is looking, because you really can't tell what's happening to a group of people if you only look at you know, whether they're men or whether they're women or boys or girls. It doesn't really give you enough information. Um, these are the different gender analysis we did of city departments. I could go on and on about each one. We did um, commissions, boards, and task forces also. Did work life already. This is the board. Um, just real quickly, gender anybody do any work on gender responsive budgeting? Um, it's all about where is the money of government going and who gives, who makes the decisions and who's giving input to those decisions and who benefits. So trying to analyze government budgets based on who's, who's making up the government budgets and who's benefiting from those government budgets. A lot of work being done internationally here. Um, almost no work being done in this country. Um, Fulton County, um, anyone know where Fulton County is? Georgia. Yeah, Georgia. You wouldn't know that Fulton County is the hotbed for gender budgeting, but it is. Um, and they have um, a whole website that um, basically outlines all the work that they've done. We trained them in 2008, and they took it a couple extra steps. It is now part of uh, their annual budgeting requirements to, to fulfill this um, piece of it. Um, I'm gonna come back and talk about, what we took this to the private sector and what it looks like in the private sector. Um, and I also wanted to just mention that we just, we do round tables, and so one of the most recent round table we did was on, um, there's a statute here in California, um, SB 657, which basically makes it uh, mandatory for large companies to outline on their websites what they're doing to stop labor trafficking um, throughout their supply chains. And so we've done a couple of round tables on that, which would be typ typical of this last project we did. Um, okay. 
Thanks, Anne. So the San Francisco CEDAW effort really has inspired um, local human rights work around the country. Um, the Human Rights Institute at Columbia Law School has been um, working to help build capacity of state and local governments to do the what San Francisco is doing, what other cities are doing. And we have a report over there, but there's we have a map. And you can see most of the examples are clustered here, right, on the West Coast. You have San Francisco, LA. Um, Eugene, Oregon is like the hotbed of human rights in the United States. It's remarkable mm -hmm. what they're doing there. Seattle, there's a lot of action there. Um, you got you have a lot of stuff happening on the East Coast as well as it's sort of spreading over here. We're really excited about this star here, <laughs> which is in Salt Lake City, Utah, where there is now a CEDAW commission in Salt Lake City. Um, and their mayor is very interested in human rights. We're excited about the star in El Paso, Texas, um, where there is a very human rights friendly sheriff, believe it or not. Um, so there are, there's human rights is sort of percolating, um, starting on the coast and hopefully moving inward. State and local human rights commissions, as you've heard, are sort of natural places for this to happen, in part because human rights is in their name, right? Um, so it's a, it's a great place to start. Um, but increasingly, other public um, elected officials and policymakers are increasingly interested as well. Um, we're very excited that this summer, the US Conference of Mayors is going to be um, voting on a resolution supporting implementation of human rights in cities. Um, there's not as much happening at the state level, so it's really exciting to hear about um, efforts to incorporate um, some of the treaties and implement some of the treaties at the state level. Um, but there really is a lot of, of, of activity and opportunity. Um, but I'd like to ask um, the experts and the panelists to talk a little bit more about, so we've heard some of the successes and some of the efforts that are underway. What do you see as some of the challenges and some of the limitations of, um, of encouraging local implementation, encouraging statewide implementation, um, and what can lawyers do and other adv legal advocates do to perhaps increase the resonance of implementation at the local level? I'll let you decide who goes first. <laughs> I, I will um, um, jump in. So I think one of the challenges um, that we've experienced certainly is how your message gets out there, right? And this goes back to the tension between rights, right? There are certain different groups would, would argue, would have different interpretations of what human rights are, what my human rights are might be different from um, what someone else's human rights are. So an example is how, um, how we look at whether to use criminal background checks in, in employment and housing, right? A b small business owner who's worked very hard to create their own business might say, hey, you know, I have a right in supporting my family and, and creating this business that's going to, you know, help me and my family access a lot of economic rights and economic power. I have a right to determine who's going to be working there and who's going to be safe in my business, right? Um, on the flip side of that, you can look at um, people who, are, who have gone through the system, made a mistake maybe when they were young, um, and then they come out. And when they're trying to put their past behind them, everyone keeps throwing it back in their face and say, no, you can't move on from this because you made the mis this mistake 10, 15 years ago, right? So there's certainly tools available in some cases, you know, in, in with the, the criminal records, uh, arrest and conviction records, we don't really have a lot of law protecting um, on folks in these class. Um, there's certain, there's, there's certainly arguments that have been made about a disparate impact theory, and especially when you're looking at largely Latino and African American communities that are impacted by the use, the broad use of criminal uh, background checks. Um, but there isn't a lot, a whole lot of protections. So, so generally, what we can do is, uh, is do a lot more education on it. Um, and that's the thing that, he, that I have done in my role, is kind of getting businesses and housing providers to think more about the policies they have in place and whether a broad ban is really what they're looking for or are there certain convictions that make people uneasy? Or are there certain, is there a certain amount of time that needs to pass before you can, you feel like you can hire someone or have someone on your property? Or is there a certain amount of evidence of rehabilitation you'd like to see before you can hire someone at the job or um, have them in your property? The idea is to get beyond this animus. Well, I don't like felons. I don't like convicts, right? To get behind that animus, and we've seen animus in other, in other times in, other, in history, right? Get beyond that and start thinking, thinking more about what does it mean when someone has a criminal history and then what does that mean for my business or housing provider? So that's what a lot of, a lot of the work that I do has been on education on that. One example, uh, I'll go back to a success, is someone came in and said, hey, I was fired because of my criminal record. I've been working this company for five years, got up and did the 5 a.m. shift every day, um, and then one day they decided to do a criminal background check, they saw that I had history of drug use, and they decided to fire me. 
So I said, look, you know, I can't do anything about that because we don't have a jurisdiction over this to say that, you know, it was wrong for them to fire you, but I can send them a letter and say about the work that we've been doing. So that's what I did. I sent them a letter and I said, you know, we have, the Human Rights Commission has been examining this issue. We know that it's overwhelmingly affecting Latino and African American people. We know that your employee was also is one in one of these protected classes. We know that this business has an interest in, in making sure that their client, their customers are getting um, safe service and top service. And we know that you value employees who have have shown up to work every day for a 5 a.m. shift, right? How can we work with you to balance your values and make sure you're keeping good people and, and also valuing the safety of your customers? And the business wasn't willing to engage in a conversation with me about that. And again, that's kind of looking, it's, it's different than kind of coming uh, as, as a hammer with a cause of action or, or bring a lawsuit. It's kind of more getting people to think more broadly as opposed to, to the animus, which I think has been very successful for, for us, and particularly in the criminal justice work and other areas as well, like I said about the <coughs> condoms of evidence. Uh, we're finding, I find my work when you come at people uh, less with a hammer uh, and more with kind of like, well, I would want to understand where you're coming from and see how we can, can work through these thoughts. Um, people are more willing to work with you in, instead of going to that kind of visceral at reaction of how we, how we think about people. Well, I would, uh, I'll identify three barriers, I think, that we're, we imagine uh, are, are coming uh, as we move this initiative forward. Uh, so one is um, the problem of partisanship. I think that over the last, um, well, it's certainly been more than 20 years, um, human rights, or at least human rights treaties, are seen as kind of a liberal democratic thing, whereas, you know, um, and, and opposing treaties is, is sort of the, you know, is for the right. And I think that's wrong. Um, and I think it partly um, that's wrong because of a lack of knowledge about what the treaties do. Partly it's because of the history of federalism and the federalism debates in which the human rights treaties got, got wrapped up in. But I think that if you were to look at, um, uh, you know, go through the ICCPR and think about the arguments that are made by, say, the Cato Institute. I mean, I'm just using them as an example. You could, you could imagine others. But there's a certain element to human rights law at least in the ICCPR, this isn't true across the board for sure, but at least with respect to the ICCPR, the, the provisions are about, um, about excluding government from individual lives. In a lot of ways, that's, that's what you see. Um, it's about you know, limitations on uh, the reach of government. And there, I think there's a conservative case for human rights treaties, especially the ICCPR, that should and could be made. They were made at the time of the ratification of the ICCPR in 1992 by the by the first Bush administration, and I think that I think that's a, it's a task maybe for all of us to rethink how it's not just rethink, but to add you know to our toolkit of implementation, our toolkit of advocacy on of these norms is not to see them in, or to at least find ways to advocate these norms in communities that aren't, we're not used to, um, to encouraging to sign on to them. So I think that that's one. A second big one is just cost. I think when we're imagining going forward and making this a legislative effort, a question, you see this at the local level for sure, which had to have underlied some of the, some of the, you know, the reluctance to provide a cause of action under the CDOT ordinance here is, well, what's, what's the, um, what's the liability for the state? And I think that's one of the tasks that we need to work through, which is, you know, when, when the United States ratified it, um, the Senate and the, the executive branch said, you know, it doesn't require any change in U.S. law, um, except to the extent where it does, and so we'll, you know, have a reservation or, or an understanding. But by and large, the argument was that there should be no change in U.S. law. But I think we need to be very clear about whether that's true as a matter of state law, because legislators are going to come back to us and say, well, what's the cost? What's the damage? to us to, um, for doing this. And then finally, I think there, there's, there's sort of a legal argument, and it goes back to the lack of understanding, lack of knowledge about what human rights law is. And I think we need to be making the case to advocates in very specific areas as to how, you know, Article 10 of the ICCPR will help you in prison litigation, or Article 12 will help you in the context of freedom of movement, when you think of things like Jessica's laws and other things in the state of California, you know, how, what is it that this actually adds to your advocacy? Because if it doesn't add anything, then why would they want to make this effort to do it? So I think, I mean, as I said at the beginning, this is a foundational effort, and, and I hope that moving forward we can draw on your experiences and maybe tie some of 
us together who are actually interested in doing this. But, but I think those are the kinds of very concrete questions that we're going to need to answer. I don't necessarily see them as barriers, but they're potential barriers in moving this kind of project forward. Um, so here was one of our biggest problems. Who can give me the elevator speech for what human rights is? One sentence. I'm looking at some of the experts over here. Anybody? One sentence, definition of human rights? Okay, I know somebody in this audience can do it. Yeah? I don't know, but the fundamental privileges and freedoms we are inherently entitled to regardless of who we are. Okay, now what does that mean? Right, and so that, you know, we were working with city workers. As a matter of fact, one of the first gender analysis we did was at the Department of Public Health. Do you know who was the director at the time? Anybody? Our mayor, Ed Lee, um, who had come from Asian Law Caucus, right? Civil rights background. Knew all about civil rights, right? We came in and said, you know, we got this statute. It's all about human rights. And, you know, here's what human rights are. And guess what? They looked at us like we were nuts. Um, and so we brought in all these human rights experts to try to explain to city workers at the Department of Public Health who clean streets, what are human rights? What are the human rights you have when you're cleaning a street? Um, and, you know, it was a tough sell. They, they, Ed Lee, you know, Asian Law Caucus, welcomed us with open arms, but they didn't get it. Um, guess who actually got it better? There's the first two departments that we did. One was uh, public works, and the second one was juvenile probation. Juvenile probation said, no way, don't come here. We can't believe you're hassle hassling us again. We've had so many groups come in here and, and do this to us, and you're going to make us do what? 30 pages of analysis, and you're not even giving us any money? Um, so they, however, had a little better understanding of um, they had girls' services, they had um, boys services, they understood, there were a lot of groups in San Francisco that were doing a lot of work on girls services and so they actually kind of got it, you know, and they came in and they did their own analysis and they did, they, we did focus groups, we did focus groups where male probation officers at night who had, who were single parents had issues around childcare and work-life balance. Um, and that was pretty cool because it wasn't coming from women. Um, but it was a tough, tough sell to bring in the rhetoric of human rights and bring it down to essentially the street level where people could understand it and make sense of it um, and, make it, and make them care about it enough to, to make a difference. Um, so that was a big issue. Um, another big issue is, I just said this, we didn't give them any money to work on this. We had one staff person, um, again, doing an, any number of different things, and they had none and we were asking them to take on a whole big new analysis um, that required time. So anytime you're doing this, I mean, we obviously have people sitting in this room who get paid to do this work, but you know what? You really can't do it as a volunteer. You can work around it, you can do a huge amount of organizing as a volunteer, but when it comes down to it, every city that's tried to do this without paid staff has failed. I mean, LA passed um, a CETA ordinance. I think they might have, they definitely had an ordinance, um, did they have staff? Yeah, maybe um, CRC resolution also. And you know what? They didn't get anywhere. Um, and you know, if you look back somewhere, um, there's a gap, 2004, 2007, nothing happened. Um, our staff disappeared. You know, we had a full-time staff person who went elsewhere um, and nothing much happened. And so that, that's a real issue. So to, for, to make these things happen, you need resources, you need staff, and you, be able to, you need to be able to talk the language that people can understand who are not caught up. Human rights is not a commonly understood term. It's still not a commonly understood term. Um, and people wanted to know really what difference does it make. So we did things like explain why where you put your street lights is really important because it makes a difference to women's safety. Um, where you put your curb cuts really makes a difference because who uses curb cuts? You know, the disabled and the elderly um, and mothers um, with um, baby carriages, right. So that's a gender issue. 
Um, but you have to sort of bring it down to a level that people can understand. Um, I could go on. But. So um, one other uh, potential limitation that might not be as relevant in California as it is in other places, the potential for backlash, right? Mm -hmm. As um, folks have been more successful at raising awareness and um, uh, getting uh, state officials interested and local officials interested in human rights, it's also inspired backlash in many places. Um, one example being the um, Oklahoma um, state constitutional referendum barring uh, state courts from considering international foreign and Sharia law um, in their decision making. <coughs> Blatantly unconstitutional and stupid, but doesn't prevent, what is it, Jamil, 22, 23 state legislatures from considering um, similar legislation around the country. And also in terms of local implementation, um, in I believe Tennessee um, and in Alabama and other places there are now, in addition to resolutions um, supporting U.S. ratification of the CEDA, um, of the CRC, there are also resolutions um, saying, uh, opposing U.S. ratification, right? So um, the opposition is getting very smart. Um, they're very coordinated, um, and they're also listening, <laughs> um, and uh, replicating efforts around the country. So in addition to um, the need to raise awareness um, and talk very concretely about the value um, added of a human rights approach and providing for resources, both internal capacity and um, financial resources. Um, I think we should also just think more about how to build grassroots and community-based support um, so that when there is political opposition, that there is um, enough political support as well to provide cover for local implementation. Um, so I want to open this up a little bit to you all because you all have the best questions um, and, uh, and we can have more of a conversation that way as well. criminal records to prevent employment or for as a reason to bar employment. Um, has there been any um, organizational push on the state level to try to introduce uh, international human rights law that might prevent the use of uh, records that are beyond a certain age or because it seems like that's the next underclass that we have all these reasons for people not to gain employment based on criminal record and they haven't had any problems since. I, you know, it seems like international law is the best place to go because people with criminal backgrounds in our society don't get much traction. So there, there is a push um, for state legislation. There's different groups who are involved in that. Um, from doing this, we're just thinking a little bit about a backlash. We certainly got our fair share of it. You know, people with criminal records are not a popular group, believe it or not. Um, and they're very easy for people to target and say, why would you do this for people who, who made this mistake? Why would you ever try to make them a protected ca class? They didn't go through what people who've gone through religious persecution have gone through. They don't, they didn't shoot, you know, people who were born of a certain race didn't choose that race, whereas someone who has a conviction chose that. Why would you ever equate them? And I, I've certainly had a fair share of heated debates with people who are liberals on this and, and think that the liberals on human rights law or civil rights discrimination work. And I, I would say that because of that backlash, our, 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 we have found less success in using international law. I think people are more, particularly politicians, are more interested in the numbers. One in four Californians has a criminal record. That's seven million Californians. That's more palatable to legislators and politicians than what you know the International Covenant on uh, the Rights of the Child or or uh, or CEDA. Or those. They want those nitty gritty things. They want to know those numbers or who's going to be their voters and who's going to be support behind them on this. I, just to follow up on that last. That last point, um, this past year, you know, California adopted the, um, you know, prohibited, um, you know, LWAP, right, juvenile uh, life without parole, parole. And, um, you know, I, in talking to the people who were very involved, I don't know if anybody here was involved in that effort, um, but in the effort in the state legislature to make that happen, I heard the same, same thing, which is there was an effort early on to make arguments based on human rights law and legislators didn't want to hear those arguments. They wanted to hear the very specifics. And you know what resonated more were, were the numbers, the figures, the um, you know the the really tragic stories. Those kinds of things made more of an impact than well, this is an obligation of the United States. I mean, I think this is something that we're fighting against as we try to you know incorporate the law. We also had some backlash. Um, we were promised. Um, that the city would um, 
basically do train train every city um, every city employee in human rights. And we were then trained that at least the department heads would be trained and that every city department would do a gender analysis. And as time went on and resources got tight, um, those promises were not kept. And so eventually we decided, you know, enough of this city work, enough of this local government stuff. We're gonna, part of our ordinance said, take CETA's principles to the private sector. Um, and so that's what we did. Um, you know, we decided we'd come back when it was a little friendlier. But so we we looked around in the private sector to see what we, what could we do to bring the principles of CETA um, basically to three quarters of the women and men who don't work for city government in San Francisco. Um, and out of that grew something called the Gender Equality Principles Initiative. So when we started to look, the first thing we did was sort of look around what was happening around the world and the whole socially responsible movement um, and what was happening at the UN, the UN Global Compact, um, which is the corporate side of the UN, you know, was sort of similar work to what we'd begun to look at. What we wanted to do was take these gender analysis that we had and adapt them. Um, and in that process, we came across something called the Calvert Women's Principles. Calvert is the socially responsible mutual fund. Um, and they had drafted something called the Women's Principles. They had worked with Unifem to do that. Um, and a group called Verite. Ver Does anyone know here know Verite? Um, you want to say what it is? <laughs> okay. Verite, it's a social auditing um, and advocacy group. They do, they're based in Washington, D.C., but they do social auditing of like factories um, and labor um, groups, labor um, standards throughout the world, uh, way before Bangladesh happened. And um, they had been working with Calvert, and we, you know, I'm not for reinventing the wheel, so we took we met with them and we actually formed an MOU with them to create something called the Gender Equality Principles, um, which is seven, pr well, no, it doesn't have it there. There are seven principles that basically outline similar principles. I'm just going to read them off to you. Anyway, the, the seven principles are, they have to do with employment um, compensation, work-life balance, career development, health and safety. This is all about the workplace, freedom from violence, management and governance business supply chains marketing, um, civic and community engagement, and transparency, leadership, and accountability. So we like to say that basically they go from the factory floor to the boardroom. Um, and together, after we developed these seven principles, we wanted to make them practical and implementation, implement, implementable, is that a word? Um, and so we started ha having round tables where at every round table, we invited private sector companies and NGOs um, and labor groups and gender experts to come share with us at roundtables, what would this principle look like? So if you were going to have um, a work-life balance um, and a career development program at your work site, what would be the indicators? What would be the benchmarks? And we came up with 600 different benchmarks together with all these folks um, and, then, and then set up a website where you could um, self-assess to see if in fact you really were measuring up to implementing these principles. Um, and we were told real quickly when we launched the website with 600 indicators, are you kidding me? Um, no one is going to fill out a 600 page assessment um, or 600 uh, indicator assessment. So we reduced it real quickly to 100. We were told that's still too many. Um, we collected a ton of resources. I want to give a hats off for a real second to um, my program manager, uh, Lizzie La Ferreri, um, and our interns who do all the, who do all the raise your hands everybody. Come on, raise your hands, up, up, up. So we get a lot of interns and they did all the research on finding over 600 resources and best practices um, and basically set up this website so companies could basically self-assess. But then you know, the lawyers got involved and the lawyers said, you know what, you're not going on any public website and self-assessing, you know, that's opening yourself up to a lawsuit, even though it was confidential. Um, so we just launched in April something new called the Gender Equality Challenge. And we are now asking companies based in San Francisco or based anywhere but with an office in San Francisco to share their best practice that matches one of these principles. And when we say share, we mean really share. Like we want to know that you've proven that this helps women in the workplace. We want to hear from the women that it's helped. We want to know that you're willing to share all the documentation that goes along with this practice so other people can use it and copy it. Um, and 
this program was um, somewhat adopted by um, the UN Global Compact, something called the Women's Empowerment Principles, very similar to um, the gender, gender equality principles here. And S New York City, just in March, launched their own similar um, initiative. So that's what we did as a backdrop. Uh, I work with an organization that does litigation as its primary focus, and we work mostly in federal courts. Um, this is CJ, by the way. Um, <laughs> and with the recent Supreme Court decision, we've been talking about how we might need to work in the state level. Um, but the fear there is that state judges will know even less than federal judges about human rights law. What kind of advocacy efforts are there in sort of training judges about human rights? And I'm happy to start answering that. So there, there is some judicial education at the state level, and increasingly state judges are interested in international human rights standards and also foreign law. Um, the Aspen Institute used to do trainings, and they've done, they did a couple of state court judges. Um, the National Association of Women Jurists, I'm getting the name wrong, they're actually very interested, and there are some very prominent um, women state court judges who um, do embrace human rights and, uh, and encourage um, uh, thinking about human rights. Um, the Opportunity Agenda is a great organization that has done, um, every couple of years, they do a report looking at state court um, decisions that cite to international and foreign law. Um, it was last updated in 2011, but I know that Northeastern Law School's Program on Human Rights and the Global Economy is updating it for 2013, but it's online if you just Google the Opportunity Agenda and state courts. Do you have it in your materials? Great, there you go. So just look in your manual. Um, but it's it's a really, California has great examples. Um, and there, as you would expect, you know, in some in some ways it mirrors the federal jurisprudence, right? So looking at death penalty cases, at LWOP. Um, but, you know, state courts in particular are great places, and you may be talking about this tomorrow, but state courts are, um, I think, exciting places to start thinking about bringing economic and social rights standards into litigation, right? Because um, they're not bound by federal jurisprudence on this because there is no federal constitutional protections for economic and social rights. Many state court constitutions do, many state constitutions do have mm -hmm. economic and social rights protections, right? Uh, particularly on education. In New York State, we have Article 17, which is really a welfare provision. Um, so state courts are used to looking to their sister jurisdictions um, for uh, jurisprudence. So they may be, in some cases, more open to looking to foreign law um, or to international law. So um, I'm very excited about the, uh, the prospect of bringing international and foreign law into state court. Um, but I think that it is very important, as you noted, to do a lot of ju judicial education around this as well because um, there is a lot of opportunity for backlash, as we saw in Oklahoma and, as I mentioned, in many other states as well. Um, although, um, it's interesting, I, I actually sat in, in in the corner of one of those state court judges' trainings, and um, there was a judge from Oklahoma there, and uh, one of the presenters asked them, what do you think about this? And he said, that's ridiculous. Like, it would never influence me and in how I think about um, about the law and you know international and foreign law comes into their jur jurisprudence all the time um, in many different ways not just with human rights right so I think that many of them are adept or used to thinking about international and foreign law well I was just going to add to the list of organizations the American Society of International Law mm -hmm. does judicial trainings and I think you might want to you know connect with them also if, if you're interested, because they do it at, at the state and federal level. Yeah. And this isn't so much training, but it's using um, the judicial system along with all the advocates. So we, basically one of the things we also do is we fund um, like $3 million worth of 20 different programs in domestic violence prevention or domestic violence shelters. Um, and um, in 2007, I think it was, um, there was a horrible domestic violence case where a woman had um, a restraining order and she was killed anyway. And we did a big investigation here and created something called um, both the Justice and Courage Project and the Family Violence Council. So the Family Violence Council has judges on it um, and basically deals with all kinds of abuse, not just domestic violence, but child abuse and senior abuse. But it brings the judges into it and they work together to um, basically try to create a seamless criminal justice system as a response to DV, and so there's some training that goes on there. Thank 
if you're um, if you think that uh, the environmental uh, movement, environment rights movement, and the laws that are both federal and state laws, uh, specifically, I'm interested in the impact assessments tools. Could be something that be replicated in the area of human rights impact assessment, uh, where obviously there is a cost, but you know, there's, it's acceptable kind of another way of assessing whether a particular policy and what, you know, what, what kind of impact it has on the environment and whether we can try to use it as a good example of, okay, you can also look at in impact, human rights impact assessment as well, uh, both federal and state. Um, another issue, if you, if you had, if you can speak to the issue of how to engage with, um, Institutions like child advocates, uh, you know, those kinds of institutions that have uh, the potential of perhaps, you know, there's a potential there of getting them more res uh, engaged at the state level in the issues of, you know, children's rights from a human rights perspective and so forth. So to what extent do you think those are, could be a good way to, to test them and use them as a models for movement towards human rights implementation? Mm -hmm. I guess I'll just jump in quickly on the assessments. I, I think California didn't California have an initiative a couple a few years ago. I thought it was um, to assess. Maybe I thought it had been CEDAW, but it was one of the human rights treaties to implement um, basically assessments in the state of California in different areas. And it passed the legislature, and Governor Schwarzenegger vetoed it. And I'm, I'll. I'll try to remember what that area was in, but it, it had been considered and, and I think considered positively in California in the past. And I think that that is a good model for thinking about implementation for sure. Certainly if, you know, if we don't, it doesn't have to exclude the possibility of a litigation fr framework, but certainly if you don't go down the litigation route, doing an assessment route is, is another way to, to do that. I think that would, that makes a lot of sense. Whether it would be, whether it would have the capacity to actually block implementation of law in the way that environmental impact statements do, I, I don't know, but that's certainly something something to think about. In terms of the advocates in specific areas, I think there just needs to be outreach um, in specific areas of advocacy, right? And I know that, that some of that is already happening, but sometimes it needs to just be targeted and to, you know, to reach out to specific advocates and say, here, here is another tool to use in your own advocacy, whether it's public advocacy or litigation. When, just to follow up on that, when we started doing the work to bring this to the private sector, that's kind of what we were looking for. Um, and there was all kinds of models out there for um, environmental sustainability. And uh, are people familiar with the UN Global Compact here? Raise your hand if you're familiar with it. Yeah, enough of you. Um, so, you know, they have their own assessment that they use. Um, and actually, there is um, a couple of different assessments that have come out of the meetings that the UN Global Compact has that do um, social assessments. Um, there's, I mean, I can't think of the exact sites um, off the top of my head, but we used them to some extent when we were modeling ours. We did a lot of research on what we thought would work um, regarding bringing the social aspects, particularly gender. It's been a struggle though, I mean, because it's much easier to talk about. Like one of the things we looked at was a number of the global, um, the Clinton global initiatives because they, but a lot of them focus on um, environmental. I mean, you can measure, and there's a, there's a lot of work being done here in San Francisco um, on, on um, environmental sustainability. And there's all kinds of measures you have that are much, plus they save money in the long run for companies. So it's, it's a much easier sell. Um, it is not as easy as, of a sell to talk about women and women's issues. That's always been a struggle. Um, but I think that that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Because I work on business and human rights primarily. And you can make a really strong argument for it saving money for a corporation to incorporate human rights and human rights due diligence up front. Um, a, a lot of money is lost because of you know litigation or people who prevent projects from going forward, civil disobedience, all sorts of other things that are a result of people having not assessed human rights up front. So that's, that's a, a, a possible argument to make also. Uh, there's also tons of studies that show the business case for gender equality. Um, 
getting back to that language issue just quickly, when we went to Fulton County and we did a human rights training, they basically told us to stop using the words human rights um, because they didn't feel like that people would get it. And so that, that was an odd thing, but. I was just gonna add quickly, the Seattle Office of Civil Rights, which is our partner, uh, or you know, partner in, in Washington, has a really good uh, racial uh, and social justice equity toolkit, which they use, which we are looking to a model. We have some limitations because of the Prop 209 about looking at race particularly, but it is certainly something we're looking at as a model. And we do more softer assessments. Like for example, last year when the mayor said he was gonna implement stop and frisk in uh, San Francisco, we did a human rights impact assessment and that involved talking to local organizations, looking what's going on, with, look at all the data that's come out of New York with stop and frisk and what's the impact been on the trust between the police and the black community in New York. And another example of that also is looking at the impact of discriminatory bus ads that were dis disparaging towards the Muslim and Arab community that were put on buses in San Francisco and what was the impact of the SFMTA's decision to run those advertisements and how did that impact particularly the communities that were disparaged in those ads. So what role does the government have in balancing the human rights you know, First Amendment rights um, and, and when it creates its policies for how to post ads, but also balancing the rights of the people who are going to be harmed by disparaging discriminatory advertisements. Um, I had just wanted to add that Sarah here is um, with the Accountability Council, and for those of you who aren't familiar with that organization, it's also based here in San Francisco, and they are pretty unique in the work that they do addressing um, corporate accountability through other supranational mechanisms that we haven't dealt with today. Um, so. Just keep that in mind um, if you're working on those issues, and I encourage you to check out their website, which has a, a really a lot of information um, on those mechanisms. That's all. <laughs> other questions? So I guess I would just put: Is if there are there any other questions from the audience? Yeah. Okay. So um, I guess I would just close with a question of what you would hope uh, folks in the room could take away from this to help to build uh, a movement for human rights in their own local communities or perhaps to aid in the efforts that you all are involved in? Let me start this um, <laughs> So one of the things we'd always hoped, you know, we've been do basically been doing this work for 15 years. Um, we're actually fairly well known outside of the U.S. We're, we're not as well known. I mean, maybe you all sitting here know about us, but most people, the people who even here in San Francisco have never heard of the work that we do. Um, and one of our, uh, we've been really busy creating a lot of models. I think somebody talked about this morning about there was no, you know, there's no blueprint. There's no models out there. You're going to just make it up. Um, that's what we've been doing. And you know, it gets a little tiring. What you really want is for like the next group to come along and take, like when Fulton County came along and took the gender budgeting to a new level, that was terrific. So what I would really love to see is, you know, we, we've done the hard work. We have at least a model for you to revise um, or try to implement, and we'd be happy to help you do that. Um, I would really, really love it if some of you in different parts of the country even, although maybe everyone's pretty local, um, could take some of the work that we've done here and take it to the next step. Um, and or come to some of our round tables and hearings to tell us what we're not doing right. Well, I would say, um, so as if you are a, a human rights litigator, that can be very dispiriting, <laughs> um, to put it mildly, in, certainly in state, state and federal court. And, um, and I think w this initiative that we're starting, um, I, I want to look at it or think about it. Maybe this is because I'm trying to lower my expectations, but think of it in the sense that even if we're not successful in, uh, in the adoption and getting to the adoption of a cause of action under the ICCPR under state law, I can imagine a lot of good coming out of it from the educational side, educating legislators, educating advocates, educating others, about what human rights law is and how it can advance advocacy in a whole range of areas. And so I guess, um, I mean, it's the end of the day and so we're all a little bit tired and so maybe I didn't really express the excitement I feel about this <laughs> particular initiative well enough, but, but I think this could be um, a, a really interesting way to engage people who aren't always engaged together um, you know, people who are advocating in different areas, but who have kind of um, a common goal of seeing, um, seeing international law be implemented 
uh, at the state and local level where, frankly, it matters most in a lot of ways, where you know most individuals' interactions is with state and local authorities. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that we can make that case, I think it could be very exciting, even if we ultimately don't get to that cause of action. And so um, sort of as a, as a proselytizing closing, um, you know, I want to first of all say uh, I will find you <laughs> if you're interested and even if you're not, but that over time, certainly over the next, you know, uh, six to 18 months, as we develop our project and, and we get the information about what we're trying to do out, I hope that you'll reach out back to us and, and let, let me know or let others who are involved in this at UCI know that this is something you'd like to be involved in as well, and then we'll keep you uh, posted as, as it moves forward. But, but, at the, but what I really want is, to, is hopefully to see over time others get excited about this possibility. Um, and I would just add that I, I hope that people get a greater awareness of how human rights policy is made in the city and contemplate the broader implications nationally. The term domestic partner came out of the Human Rights Commission and is now a national term that, that businesses know, that other gov that governments in this country know. It's something that came from San Francisco. I would argue that conversation about gay marriage was dramatically influenced by San Francisco by you know the previous administration. A lot of things start in San Francisco. You know we have a funny reputation in some corners of this country but a lot of good things um, come out of San Francisco and we because of our reputation we have the ability to influence policy in ways that other jurisdictions can't. So I would say if you're upset about the way the, way the FBI profiles and surveils certain communities in this country you should look at what their SFPD is doing and how are they applying those policies locally. If you're upset about um, the anti-immigrant rhetoric, rhetoric that comes out of some congressmen's mouths, comes out of some, some, some state legislators, look at how we're implementing our sanctuary city ordinance in San Francisco and what can we do to strengthen that sanctuary city ordinance. If you're upset about the war on drugs and how much federal money is wasted on the war on drugs, then look at how um, we're spending the money that we get from the federal government and is that working in San Francisco. Think about, you know, I was once really involved in looking at international rights too and when I started looking at how this stuff plays out at home and how much more access I have to my legislators and the policymakers here, I knew that I could make more of a difference here. So I would encourage all of us to kind of think about how we can make a difference on a local level and think about how San Francisco can be a leader on a lot of these initiatives. Well, even at the end of the day, I am really excited about each of your initiatives. So please join me in thanking our panelists and thanks to you all for your attention.